it's been fun to see everyone's reactions to this acolyte drama. I caused a firestorm on Twitter X by just saying the Jedi are the good guys. It's pretty crazy. But this is the state of Disney Star Wars. Yeah, I said the Jedi are the good guys. And someone said, I bet you like cops too. <laughs> wow. Just wow. That's I. You just have to laugh at this point. But again, that's, that's the fan base that's left. You can't even call it a fan base at this point. Anti-fans, I guess. That's the environment that Disney is cultivating. Those that hate Star Wars, that hate its heroes. We're the only fans that are left, and it's hard to even refer to them as fans at this point because it seems that all that are left defending Disney Star Wars are ones that are pro possibly shills that have a benefit to them promoting the show, or they just never liked Star Wars. They never liked it. I got so many comments that are saying like the Jedi are garbage or the movies were bad, that the previous movies were terrible, or just all of these things. It just proves that they completely don't understand anything about these fundamental elements of the original six movies, and they're not even fans of it. But those are the ones that are left at this point, that don't even like Star Wars, that don't like the Jedi. And I'm sorry, that's not enough to support yourself, uh, Lucasfilm. Totally agree, they want it both ways, to make their own version of the lore, but still get the ratings based on the original IP. Yeah, they want to have their cake and eat it too. I mean, cl clearly the ratings though, the viewership have been on a steady decline. Now I think Kenobi got some good viewership, but of course, obviously it's because you had uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin returning. The only parts that people really liked is just them finally facing off, but it was so boring to get there and none of the stuff made sense and it was lore breaking in a ton of other ways. So I think after that, and they realized that was it, the Acolyte just feels so far removed from Star Wars. Well, and again, like I was saying with Dave Filoni, he just views all of this as tall tales. He doesn't give two hoots about canon and lore. It's like jazz music to him, whatever that. Ugh. But see, that's the problem. If you don't adhere to canon, then it doesn't feel connected to this mythology. So what are we even doing here? We, we have these shows that just feel so disconnected. Andor doesn't seem at all in the same universe as all of these other shows. Nothing seems to fit together, but that's what canon and continuity is for. Andor is the only intelligence show they've come up with. I know there were ones that weren't uber fond of it because, I mean, they like the, the force side of things. They like that, but I, mean, I thought it was an interesting premise. And, and you had someone who was like Tony Gilroy, who actually had experience in this kind of espionage-like stories. He did the Born Identity movies. So he actually had someone who was qualified to do it. And the writing was really good. There was Luthen's speech is probably one of the best things that has come out of it. I love his speech. He, so, so well done, well written, superbly acted. That's what happens when you get qualified, competent people to make a show. But even then, man, it cost 250 million. And I don't even think the viewership was that great, but we're getting to season two, which I actually am somewhat interested to see. <laughs> If anyone will watch it at this point, it kind of has cultivated a kind of by word of mouth, people have started to, to pay more attention to it. So maybe that will be all right. It's not my favorite. It's not my favorite in terms of like, I love it. It's, it's like an essential viewing for me. Um, it is interesting. And again, it's one of the most well-made things that they've done. Andor depicted the empire the way they should be. Oh yes, it's like <laughs> actual competent villains. Yes, they did that well. And it looked good. I, I thought that the costumes, also the props and everything else really well made. It's just staggering the difference. This is the difference in just to have someone qualified and competent running the show. So you have someone who's, who's handling the rebellion and espionage like show. So you get someone who has experience in that. It's, it's really just a no brainer. And from what I can tell, he, he was striving to keep within the canon that the at least A New Hope, like leading up to that, and of course with Rogue One, to be consistent with that. I think Andor even started by showing what year it was. And I think they're gonna, again, do that in season two. I think they're gonna have three episodes and then skip forward a year. I think there's 12 episodes too, so it's, it's a pretty ambitious project. I don't know if they have the same budget though. 250 million for season one, that, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> but yeah, I think the positive word of mouth for that show will probably be good. I know, I'm, I'm excited to see, what was the K2SO? I liked him. I was sad he wasn't in the season one. 
But again, uh, the problem that I had with Andor, and this is why I think Luthen was these other original characters were really good to introduce and focus on, was because we don't know their fates. I mean, we know what it, where it's going. We know where Andor is headed. So I feel like that takes away a kind of a significant portion of the drama, which honestly, I just feel like they should have named it something else. They shouldn't have named the show Andor. They should have named it like, I don't know, The Rebels, The Rebellion, or something like that, because it was clearly an ensemble show. I don't know why they just chose one character, like, oh, that's the name of the show. I don't know why they're doing that. Now, you know, Ahsoka, Kenobi, Mandalorian, and Grogu movie, their naming conventions need to change. Of course, a lot of things need to change. That's the, that's the least of their worries at this point.